Ladies and gentlemen, the history of chess has brought us some of the most fascinating games ever played, and today is really no exception. Uh, you are about to witness one of the most incredible, fascinating, and weird things you've ever seen on a chessboard. And I know that your success rate for creating such a game is like 33%, but trust me, th th this one will definitely take the cake. So, uh, th this is a tournament in 1984, uh, I believe in Nuremberg, and uh, the protagonists are Emil Joseph Diemer and uh, Dr. Thomas Heiling. Now, Diemer, a uh, very famous uh, individual uh, who has an opening named after him, uh, but also was a Nazi, basically a Nazi. I, I said Nazi sympathizer in another video. Now, like, this dude was, like, super pro-Nazi. He was kicked out of the German Chess Federation later on in his life for being a total lunatic. And, you know, it's a little bit weird making videos about the guy, but yeah, a lot of you asked for this, and this is a crazy game. So let's just put that aside briefly and enjoy the chess. D4, knight f6. Now, you know a spoiler of this video, right? One guy is supposed to move 17 pawns in a row at some point, right? F3. So Diemer actually liked to just take the center completely. He was not going to surrender it at all. Um, and uh, his opponent played d6. And so he played e4, and now g6. Now here, any basically any normal human will play like c4 to actually take the game into a King's Indian defense samish variation with f3, uh, which repels bishops and knights on the g4 square and actually really just negates the development of that light squared bishop a lot uh, on these three squares. Or you play knight c3, bishop e3, and you don't play the queen's pawn to, uh, well, the, the, I'm saying queen's bishop's pawn to c4. So you just control the center and... That's just the peers. But we're talking about Diemer. So he plays g4 because he don't give a damn. He don't give, he don't care. So bishop g7, I mean, black is just like, you know, black after g4 could attack with h5, but black is like, I don't know what this dude is doing. And um, Diemer makes a fifth pawn move in a row. So g5 attacks the knight. Now, where does this knight go? To be honest, there's a lot of good moves. Knight to h5 is good, but the knight could get stranded and potentially targeted. And then that knight could be used as a breakthrough point. You could go all the way back to g8. Uh, knight d7 is also fine. Don't go here, here, or here because the knight will be lost. Knight d7, fantastic. And now black, very standard style, will attack the center with c5, or you can attack the center with e5, or you can attack the center with knight to c6. Diemer plays f4. That is now six pawn moves in a row. Um, you would think that he would begin bolstering his pawns with his knights, maybe with, well, that's actually a pawn, so never mind. Um... So black plays c5. However, that uh, unfortunately invites yet another pawn move. So now we have uh, a mini bathtub pawn structure. And then if you combine this pawn structure with that pawn structure, you get a, you, you get a Pokeball or a Voltorb. Voltorb, let's call it a Voltorb. So b5, now b5 is actually, it's actually a good move because bishop takes b5 is not possible. Uh, queen a5 check would win the bishop. Um, if you play knight c3 to defend, bishop takes, and then queen takes bishop. So b5, and, and plus, I mean, black knows that, that, that white is going to play 17 pawn moves in a row, right? No, he doesn't. So bishop takes b5 wouldn't even have been possible. So what is white's pawn move going to be at this point? Well, white plays c3, which, you know, makes sense. At this point, I would just really stubbornly get one of white's pawns to not move. Like, I don't know, go go play like queen a5 and queen takes pawn and then he's going to have to move the rook and haha, -ha, a YouTube video cannot be made about you 37 years in the future. This game is played in 1984. So, um, great year, by the way. Wow, for such a book. or Very Orwellian. A6. Well, A6 is a non-confrontational move. So if, at this point, if I asked you what is white going to play, uh, white, uh, well, what do you think? Well, white plays H4. I mean, obviously. And now the next couple moves are, are maybe also very obvious. At this point, I would have really would have liked black to play H5. I mean, in general, in these structures, I just say like H4, H5 should just be played automatically. Now, if Diemer then would have taken on Poisson, at least black, you know, gets a good strong bishop or a rook pressuring this pawn. Uh, but black plays knight b6. I mean, black is like, if I just do nothing, is he just going to keep moving pawns? The problem is white strategy is actually not completely idiotic. If I plug this position into an engine, the engine actually says white is better. It's, it, it says that white is about plus 0.7. And that's only if black plays perfectly. Um, if black does not play perfectly, white is not going to be plus 0.7. It's going to be much worse. Um, so e6. Uh, and now white plays a very modern type of move, uh, which is h6, which slows down the pawn initiative. 
Uh, but that's 11 pawn moves in a row now. And uh, movement for black is severely restricted, right? So at this point, the best pawn move is uh, is actually to counterattack on the enemy flank. That looks like it just blunders. It looks like after a4, something like knight takes a4 is just coming. Um, and if that happened, there is a good chance that um, Diemer would have played c4. So he would have made yet another pawn move to undermine the defense of this knight and target this with the bishop, while his home base just sits like this. I mean, if anything, the white position is a microcosm for, you know, armies. The royalty sits back and let the pawns do all the fighting and, and killing each other. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. E takes d5, so obviously white is going to... Ah, in between move! And now this is 14 pawn moves in a row, but how's he going to make three more? How's he going to make three more? I mean, four of his pawns physically cannot move forward anymore. So it's at this point, you know what I really would have liked? At this point, black should have played queen e7. I don't even care if it's not the best move. He should have played this move because that would force white to move a piece. And then Dimitri would have probably gotten up and punched the guy in the face because he was a lunatic. Um, bishop e7. Now white plays c4. Black plays f6. Excuse me, f6 beginning some counterplay. We have cb5, fg5, and Dimitri plays f5. That is the 17th and final pawn move in a row, and it's minus three for black. Black is completely winning. What Dimer had to play here was b6. He had to wedge this pawn over here, and that actually does happen later, but he had to wedge that pawn over there, and on g takes f4, he actually could have moved maybe 18 pawn moves in a row uh, rather than 17, uh, but of course, b3 is a terrible move because at this point, black has consolidated and is quite ready to overtake the game. So why did he play f5? Well, he played f5 uh, because uh, he's offering his opponent the pawn and potentially trying to go attack him. Uh, and uh, black should not take. I mean, black should play something like castles, just bringing the king to safety. This is anything but scary. I mean, if, if it's scary for anybody, it's scary for the guy with the white pieces because knight e5 comes, g4 comes, bishop comes, queen comes, next bishop comes... Very bad position for white. But black played g takes f5 and tried to call the bluff. The problem with this is that knight f3 now comes and white actually has something to play for. So knight to f3 attacks this. Black plays rook g8, not stupid at all. And now Dimer concludes his, uh, his pawn wedge on the queen side. So how do you even evaluate a position like this? Well, if you've seen my video called how to evaluate any chess position, you begin with material. Material is uh, black is up a pawn, okay? Uh, king safety. I don't have any clue. Like, I have no clue whose king is safer. I want to say black's king is safer, but I honestly, I don't know. It could be they're both very weak, but I think black's king is safer. Space, uh, probably white is winning by space and active pieces. It's also very, it's, it's just such a weird position because on the one hand, these pieces can't move. On the one hand, on the other hand, where are white's pieces ever going to go? So, I don't know, super mysterious position. Bishop b7, attacking the pawn, and now white plays knight c3. These are perhaps the two least complex moves of this entire game. And maybe knight f6. Knight f6 attacks the queen, and here uh, Diemer strikes uh, utilizing a concept known as danger levels, which was not yet, uh, they were not familiar with this in 1984. Uh, but knight takes g5. So you hang your queen, but you're going to go knight e6 with a fork. I think maybe black missed this, um, but the truth is it's not clear to find what to do next. Maybe a bishop f6 to attack the knight and try to attack this king, but the king will just sidestep off, off of like 2f2 or to maybe even d1. But okay, knight f6 takes, now we have the queen taken, we have check, we have this, we have takes, and two knights are hanging. Uh, black plays the best move here, attacking this rook. And if this rook were to move, you would just take this. So this knight continues its journey and actually just takes this bishop. Now we see the power of this wedge. That pawn is now suddenly extremely useful. But how the hell is black gonna escape? Certainly this knight will not escape, right? So now white plays bishop f4. Ah, but that's... That's not complicated. I mean, we're just going to defend the pawn, right? White castles long. So at this point, black is now up two points of material, but white is definitely winning the battle of king safety. White is also winning the battle of much more space in the position. Much more space. And when you have more space, you restrict your opponent's movement, especially if your opponent's pieces are stuck in the back rank. Because if they're trying to get out, I mean, and there's a military blockade outside of their house... A lot of war analogies in this video. I mean, if there's a military blockade around their house, it's going to be difficult, right? But if they're already 50 miles away, they don't care. But like this knight, this knight doesn't care. This knight's going to dance around. But how are these pieces going to get out? I don't know. 
So knight f2 attacks the rook. The problem is the rook now activates and targets the bishop. The rook was not doing anything on d1. It was staring at the, the, this pawn, right? But now it's staring at the enemy bishop. So black needs to move the king or else this pin is going to take serious effect. King d7. And actually now, play looks like it has been stopped. It looks very briefly like white has no way forward. Again, black has just enough thorns in the position, like you can't put anything on b5. Um, this knight, I mean, but... but, but it's kind of like a what was that i just went a little australian oh my this video is so all over the place it's kind of like it's kind of like a mutual stalemate or quagmire if you will uh no one can move except white can move the problem when you have a dominant space advantage is that oftentimes invisible moves appear knight b5 when you have a dominant space advantage like this, and particularly a weak king on the other side and restricted peace play, you can make moves that don't look possible sometimes. You just can't. Knight b5 is one of those moves. The threat is knight c7. And I just said, well, pawn takes b5, right? No, no, bishop b5. And actually, it's maiden seven moves. Because the knight can come in, but then bishop takes, which means the only move is this, which means this... And now you're getting swarmed by all four pieces. The rescue operation for this knight is coming, and it's mate. I mean, first of all, mate in one is threatened, so you know it's going to be mate very soon. Um, so black uh, obviously cannot take and plays knight e4, which looks like a very reasonable move. The problem is rook takes e4. Demer is a, is a lunatic. I've said this multiple times, and uh, rook g1 is played. Well, rook g1 got played because if fe4, bishop h3 would have come, and then this would have come, and then you would have taken this, and then this pawn would have probably promoted, and... Yeah, I mean, he's hitting from all sides, right? Like, if we just look at the tactical prowess, knight b5, and then down the middle, and then over here. I mean, beautiful coordination, right? So, takes, black tries not to take, and just sacrifices the rook for this powerful bishop before taking on b5. And black still maintains a degree of equality. I think it's actually completely equal from the material standpoint, but these pieces are not getting anywhere in the game. So now white plays rook g1, and uh, it's bad news. It is very bad news. Black goes for this piece, but now it escapes. Bishop d6, uh, knight d7, and uh, it looks maybe we will have like a repetition, but rook takes h7 for a good measure. Now there are three, four passed pawns for white. Those passed pawns have made it through. The black defenses have been absolutely shattered. And after rook takes a5, b7 deflecting the piece. Um, he also maybe could have even played take, take, and b7 on its own because nobody can stop the pawn, but he does it like this, wins the knight on d7, and, um, king c8, h7, and a couple moves later in this position, black resigned. And that is how Emil Joseph Diemer played 17 pawn moves in a row and uh and won the game now before you go before you go listen you made it this far in the video don't click off just yet i know the sidebar looks good i know you want to go watch your favorite sport or whatever but hold on favorite minecraft you hold on you need to fit we need to figure out together why the hell this was even possible right how the hell this even happened well here's the thing black actually played relatively normally right bishop g7 g5 now it would have been better to play knight to h5 because this move actually prevents a lot of what white wants. The knight is awkward here, but it fights for a lot of dark squares. And h4, knight g3 already would mean that white cannot make 17 pawn moves in a row, which is basically a moral victory. So knight h5 is very good. If white tries to turn the attention with bishop e2, you need to attack the center like this and just win the complex battle. The, the, the color complex battle for the dark squares. But even if you go knight d7, right? Something like d5, you know, b5. This was actually all good, but, the, but, but black played incorrectly this is way too slow and does not address white's initiative now the interesting thing is once it already got to this point white's position was really good black basically had one moment to deal with this so next time your opponent throws a bunch of pawns at you you need to find a way to crack it right open block the pawn initiative and win the complex battle on the colors you cannot just play slowly on the opposite side of the board black played on the side of the board where nothing was going on completely not addressing the problems that were coming this might look stupid but if you don't refute it it's actually going to be brilliant because naturally pawns are the fence of the position and if i can just take a ton of land away from you for my own purposes and give you nothing for it well then you got eminent domain on your hands wow
A lot of metaphors in this video. I hope you enjoyed this game. If there are other historical games you would like me to cover for you, uh, do let me know in the comments. Uh, until next time, peace out. Get out of here.